Okay, and we're back. Hope you stretch your legs, take a coffee or anything you like. And now we are going with the next speaker, which is Lorna Mitchell. Hi, Anorna. Buongiorno, lovely to be here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. So we are here so to, to, to hear you talking about time series database, that's right? That's right. It's my current favorite topic. I, I just scratched the, the, the topic myself, so I'm really interested to, to see. You're from Yorkshire, UK, right? So, and you work as a developer advocate for Ivan. That's, that's what, what's, right. I, what does Ivan do? Because I don't know them. <laughs> okay, so Ivan does open source data platforms as a service. So if you need MySQL, Postgres, Redis, Kafka, or a time series database, or a few other things, uh, you can find it as a service at Ivan, and we're on all the clouds. So you can deploy that to AWS or Google Cloud or DigitalOcean, wherever you're going. Okay, great to know. So you're basically a, a, an old acquaintance of the PHP world, let's say. You've uh, out, uh, if I remember well, joined into uh, at the origin years ago. So thank you for that. We are, it's really helpful for conference and speakers. And you obviously worked a lot in open source. So you know what you're talking about, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> a lot more than me, at least. Okay, uh, this talk will be pre-recorded, so uh, you'll be available in the chat. Uh, so if you want to interact with Lorna, write in the chat, write uh, a question in the Q&A so we can gather them and uh, respond to them timely at the end of the talk. Okay? Yep. Ready for I'll the be talk. in the chat. Please distract me from having to watch myself on video. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lorna, developer advocate for Ivan. We do interesting open source database things in the cloud. Uh, I'm here today to talk about time series data and databases. So I'll start by talking about what time series data even is. And then we'll also talk about the databases that you can use and kind of how that relates to the PHP ecosystem, whether you have an existing application or maybe if you're starting something new. So we'll talk about traditional Postgres stuff and then I'm also gonna introduce you to some of the new shiny, including my favorite, M3DB. So let's start with time series data. So time series data is a very specific type of data. Probably you've all seen it. Um, it involves a timestamp. So it's a point in time value of something. The value itself. And often it'll come with some other data. So it'll be labeled or tagged um, with the thing it's a measurement of, uh, which measurement it is. Maybe if you have a, a Raspberry Pi um, in the kitchen that measures the temperature and the humidity and another one somewhere else, then they would come in with location uh, tags and also um, which measurement it is. This data is immutable. You never update that temperature measurement of the kitchen at 8 p.m. <laughs> it just, it is what it is. And we write it once and then we never edit it. So that data is, we can describe it as immutable. Time series data, you see it in a bunch of different applications. And I think as we move to having more and more data in the world, in our lives, um, it's something that we'll see more of. So it can be uh, sensor data, tracking data, anything with lots and lots of updates. And then it can also be like metrics data. We use it a lot in the sort of monitoring space as well. So time series data, we've got time, we've got data, clues in the name, and then we've got extra metadata attached. So you can kind of imagine a home fish tank measurement where we are collecting that temperature data and just keeping an eye on it over time. Um, the fish are pretty comfortable around this sort of 25 degrees mark. If it gets a lot hotter or a lot colder, that's a problem. And perhaps we could set some alerts on that. 
So now you're thinking, or certainly I'm thinking, fish tank. Uh, but, <laughs> but in reality, the specialist time series stuff is if you have started with a fish tank and now you have an aquarium, <laughs> that gives you the idea of the size of the challenges that we're looking at here. So think of your favorite aquarium. Think of how many things you would like to measure in that building. Yeah, you have time series data. <clears throat> and it's it's quite special in a way. It's it's an unusual database usage to have such this long skinny table, uh, just a few columns usually. Lots and lots and lots and lots of writes, no updates, and potential potentially quite tricky queries. It's atypical behavior for databases. This is not the way that we usually do the database thing, right? So that's why we use some special tools and even some specialist databases to deal with it. And we'll talk more about that later. So you're a PHP developer and you wanna work with time series data. What should you do? Well, you could use Postgres. I mean, that's it. That <laughs> that's the punchline of the talk. We could all save time and go to the pub now. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, this is the answer for the majority of the systems that I see. Um, you can go a really, really long way with Postgres. And um, I am gonna show you some new shiny today. Like, I'm, I'm not seriously gonna bail at the four minute mark on my talk. Um, I'm gonna show you some Postgres tricks. Then I'm gonna show you some new shiny, but only if you promise to think hard about how big your data challenge is and what the right tools for that would be. I think if anyone understands the value of somewhat boring technology that absolutely gets the job done, it might be this community. Um, it, it's something that I appreciate greatly about PHP. Um, is it's uh, it's it's such a great great tech choice and Postgres alongside it. MySQL, if you have that as well. Um, I'm more familiar with Postgres and it just has a little bit more, uh, which is why I'm kind of fixed on that today. To talk about data, it is useful to have some sort of a data set. Um, so today I have brought you weather data from a place called Manchester. It's a city near to where I live in Northern England. Manchester is famous for two things. Uh, one is football, uh, which we are big fans of here in the UK. And I understand there's football in Italy as well. Um, the other thing Manchester is famous for is rain. <laughs> so it's an ideal place to use a data set from. I have hourly weather measurements for a 40 year period um, from uh, the readings in Manchester. So every hour, every 24 hours a day, every day of the year for 40 years, because the data started somewhere in the mid seventies and you can get it right up to today, but I just did round numbers. So now we've got all this data. Um, <clears throat> it's too much data. Okay, I mean, it's not big data, it's less than half a million rows, um, but still, I wouldn't want to read it by hand. So when we start to work with this sort of data, the aggregation features become very, very useful indeed. So <clears throat> we can select, for example, the average temperature for each week. I don't need to know the temperature every hour, but understanding how that changes perhaps over time as the seasons change, then we can use Postgres for that. And perhaps you've written queries like this where I'm using both the date trunk function. So that truncates a date. So you can have one second, one minute, one hour, one day, one week. I think it does a year as well. Um, you can sort of chop it down to one unit and I'm using the aggregate function AVG here for average. So that gives me the average temperature over a week. Hopefully you've seen this before. There's a bunch of things in Postgres that are sort of like this. We've got the sliding window functions, which are well worth a look. Um, 
even without breaking out of the relationship, if we were to stay faithful um, to PHP and Postgres, Postgres can give us a lot, but you may need to break out of your ORM to do it. Um, a lot of them will support custom SQL and then let you hydrate objects back from that. Um, but don't be afraid to go and use, you know, your favorite uh, query browser, whatever your IDE has, PG admin, poke at it from the command line if that's the way your brain works. I am a little bit old school with that. Um, and just try out those queries, look at the performance. There might be times where you have to get beyond what we get out of the box with our ORMs when we're dealing with some of this data. So that's, <clears throat> we've got a bunch of options. You could go far with this, um, especially if you are not afraid of database indexes. Um, that's a whole different talk, but date cardinality can be a real, a real trap. And I think my top tip is uh, don't be afraid to, you know, fork your database. Um, just get a copy of it and spend some time with your busy queries, like just dropping some indexes and see what happens. Drop the date index, see what happens. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a dark art. So that's just vanilla Postgres. The next step is to extend PostgreSQL with some other tools. So next I'm going to talk about Timescale DB. Um, and this from their website, Timescale DB is a category defining relational database for time series data. So you are going to use time series DB when either your table gets unwieldy, like too large and you need some sort of charting features. We've got hyper tables in timescale DB or when you need the additional query functionality. So timescale is a Postgres extension. You can install it to existing Postgres. You can convert existing tables and best of all, nothing outside of Postgres cares that that has happened. So it works like PostgreSQL, it talks like PostgreSQL, your application will have no idea that anything happened here. And that's why it's getting my shout out because I think it's a really good extra stepping stone before you have to rewrite a whole load of stuff or move the time series database to a separate service. Um, this, is the, this is step one for help Postgres is creaking. The hypertable stuff is super cool and it kind of chunks the table down and you can make use of some of the scalability features. It also makes it easier to throw away the older data because the chunks are sort of time based. That's very neat. I mentioned the additional features and this is the thing that normally pushes me into time scale DB. Um, <clears throat> and it's this time bucket function. It allows it. At the beginning, it looks just like date trunk, right? You can get stuff over a week or a day or whatever. But crucially, you can also get it over multiple ones of those, which date trunk does not have. <laughs> so you can have five minutes, not just one minute or one hour. You can have, I don't know, four hours, <laughs> whatever makes sense. So it's got that concept of the multipliers um, and being able to have sort of bigger or smaller windows. And this can be really crucial if you need to um, produce some reports or whatever, then this is really nice. So you select with the time bucket function, you give the um, interval that you're interested in and the, the column to use for that. And again, I'm still using the average function straight from Postgres. So I'm calling it month, it isn't, it's four weeks, so you get 13 of them in a year. But it's a really nice way to kind of look at how that data changes over the seasons in Manchester. Uh, it occasionally gets warmer than you'd think, but mostly in the early 80s. <clears throat> One more thing I want to talk about with uh, time series data is the need for aggregation. And Timescale DB supports downsampling. So that's where we take a set of data points, we look at the calculations we're likely to run on them, and we run them and we persist them. So we store them. Um, Timescale has what we call continuous aggregates. And you can think of them as a materialized view in relational database terms. Um, everything about Timescale is sort of familiar. Your tools work, 
we've got some extra functions and it's got this extra um, continuous aggregate. So you can say, I'm always gonna want every like a five minute and a six hour interval. And I want you to store like the maximum in the last five minutes or the average for the last five minutes. Um, so let's talk a little bit more then about this kind of special aggregation step because it's something that we don't often do um, in our more traditional databases. You know, in PHP, we've often done a lot of like content management databases or product management databases, um, account management. Uh, there's a bunch of things here, but when it's this very distinctive data type, we're gonna be down sampling. And it's a key concept in uh, time series data. We've got all this data, we've got every data point from the last 24 hours. Um, and maybe that might be like every uh, 10 seconds or something. And then we might not wanna keep that for very long. Also, it's quite big. Uh, maybe we're just gonna keep one measure per minute for 24 hours or um, hourly for the last 90 days. You get the idea. So we don't, if I'm gonna look at 90 days worth of data, I don't need every 10 seconds. Um, and this is this graph is, so it's Grafana, which we also have on the Ivan platform, which is why it shows up in my demos. Also it's brilliant, like best in class. When we downsample data, it's because we don't need every data point forever. The top graph is nine days worth of data. It's hourly, you can kind of see the day cycle. Clearly we had some not so sunny days in the middle there. Uh, and then off it goes. Cool. The lower graph is three years. So you can kind of see the seasonality averages, but with all the noise because of all the data points, uh, we could get that overall picture from a far lower resolution of data. So this idea of reducing detail over time, um, I'm not sure what the video compression will have done to these images, but on the left, to me, looks great. <laughs> the middle one's a little bit fuzzy, and the one that's remaining really just gives you an impression of what might be left. You have an idea of what was here, but you couldn't reconstruct the original image from this. And that's a really important point, that you can't regain the data that you've lost. This process is always lossy. You can't get the max values from data you have already averaged. Um, so it's a trade-off. It does massively reduce the storage space because as you can see, I've only got a few pixels in the one on the right. Um, but it's you lose something in that trade-off and that's why we'll sometimes keep high res data for a short period of time and then drop down to lower res for longer periods of time. That's a really common pattern and it's really useful. <sighs> so we've talked about uh, specialist time series. We talked about Postgres and now I would like to talk about more specialist databases, um, the other options that you have. Um, so I've got, I've picked a few, there's a bunch. Let's just be clear, this is not exhaustive. These are my favorites, stuff that I've been playing with. Um, Prometheus, you may already have this in your, particularly like a monitoring setup. So Prometheus is a tool that hits those health check or metrics endpoints and scrapes data. So it's running somewhere and it interrogates all the other nodes to say, hey, what's going on? How are you feeling? Um, so that's Prometheus um, and it's, it's, a, it's like a pull thing. You probably may have it in your setup already. It may be familiar to you. We've got InfluxDB, um, which is designed for time series data. It's open source if you're only running a single node. It's kind of open core for the clustered version. Um, M3DB is distributed time series database, open source all the way through. N3DB is an interesting one. Um, it came out of Uber. So if you think about, you know, some of the data points that Uber might be dealing with, <laughs> um, and I think this was more for their metrics, like server metrics than necessarily all the geographical data stuff. Um, that's a lot of data. And M3 is designed to operate 
to solve that size of problem. Uh, so that's kind of trying to give you a sense of scale of what this tool kind of is intended for. Um, <clears throat> M3DB is, it has a few different components, not the simplest thing to operate. I mean, I mean Ivan has it as a service, which is why I'm messing with it because people, I have people for that. <laughs> or rather, they pay my hosting bills, which is nice. The other thing to say about M3DB is it's designed as a backend for Prometheus. So you, Prometheus doesn't have a lot of storage, you normally ship it somewhere. M3DB is designed to come on the back of Prometheus as one of its modes of operation. Your applications can also write their own apps into it, which might be more likely for a PHP application, you tell me. But that's probably between you, you have all of the options. Uh, Victoria Metrics is also very similar to M3DB in the sense that it's distributed time series, it's open source. They're both reasonably new, they both have a great community around them. Um, I've tried M3DB because it's on the Ivan platform. That's kind of how that works. So I want to put this up here to give you an idea of what's there um, and, and some insight into which bits of new shiny you might want to pick up and play with when you're coming to um, tackle a problem like this one. The reason that M3, I don't think I'm breaking company confidentiality. <clears throat> the reason that M3DB, despite it being really new and not that widely available um, as, a, as a service, the reason it's as a service on the Ivan platform is because we use it. So all that, obviously, we're, we're running a lot of nodes. <laughs> we're a database as a service provider. It is a non-trivial problem. Um, and we outgrew the influx that we had. And so we went to this M3DB distributed time series database um, cluster and we loved it. So now, <laughs> because we're a very technical company and this is how that works, now it's available as a service. We liked it. We think you might like it. Um, which I think is a really fun way to do, <laughs> to do product development. Like, oh, I've got a cool thing. Oh, I love this thing. Let's offer it as a service. Okay, then that's a thing. Okay, so I'm going to use the M3DB stuff as examples today um, because I have been enjoying it. Um, you know, that's, I feel like that's my prerogative. Let's talk a bit about the architecture and how those things fit together. So um, in, let's start in the middle. In the middle, I have the database and the coordinator. So M3 comes with three different types of component. Um, M3DB is one and M3 coordinator is another one and they come in pairs. So you can see here, I've got three pairs um, inside the main cluster. So that's like an, a standard, um, Ivan M3DB. You can get a single node for testing, but then why are you using a distributed database with a single node? Uh, so this is like our standard sort of business plan with three nodes uh, and you just talk to the cluster and things happen. So we've got these three pairs and we've got on the left, still my left, probably your left, we've got your application. Um, and your application can send whatever data it needs to, whether it's sensor readings or metrics or uh, doesn't matter, um, into M3DB. So when you're collecting those time series readings, you can send them here, just as you would send them to Postgres or any other storage. Over on the right hand side, I've got Grafana, uh, which is what generated the graphs that you saw earlier. So the thing about very large amounts of data is that it's kind of difficult to think about when you're just reading the individual points or returning a set of rows. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a list of categories from a blog database, right? It's as many pieces of data as there are sky, stars in the sky. Um, so Grafana is the visualization tool. It's another open source tool. It's also available on the Ivan platform. All the words you expect me to say here. Um, and the reason that we visualize these large data sets is because the human visual abilities are incredible for pattern matching or pattern spotting. So you can look at a graph and say, oh, what happened? You know, this is like either a big cliff or a, the opposite of a cliff. <laughs> it all just went away, everything turned off. 
um, we can see that very easily and that's why we often you know anyone who's doing that sort of um, monitoring type work always has visualizations not current total graphs rolling graphs of what's happening because we're so good at that so Grafana is in my opinion the best way to inspect time series data um, and I speak as a person who is kind of a command line prompt person most of the time this type of data that really makes no sense and I will just plug in Grafana as a debugger rather than poking queries as I might have done for other types of data so uh, yes I think this is quite a nice way to think about it let's talk about the aggregator component that's at the bottom of the diagram here this is an optional component <clears throat> and if you specifically on the Ivan platform I'll just if you get if you if you need an aggregator um, component then that's a separate service and you just spin it up and connect it to your m3db um, and that's because you might not need it if you are not doing that downsampling the what we call the aggregated namespaces with m3db you don't need the aggregator component so we're not spinning that up for you and charging you for the resource or whatever you tell us <laughs> if you need that or what um, so that's the aggregator it might be there it might not be there this depends on your needs um, you can have different numbers of m3db and coordinator pairs inside your in your in your cluster the thing on the left the app it's a two-way arrow so you can write your values in you can run queries from the app so if you're doing um, any sort of dashboards or reporting or whatever you can do the queries straight against the database there that's also fine um, the other setup which I don't have here but I think is really worth a mention especially for the sort of server monitoring pattern use cases is as I say M3 is intended as a backend for Prometheus as well as um, being an ordinary database that you can write to so you might have Prometheus between your app which I've drawn very neatly in a little box probably yours is like epic lots of nodes and things going on that's fine <laughs> but you would just have like one Prometheus and in in between M3 and all the other bits this is very I, I really enjoy these architecture diagrams where I just put like one small harmless box <laughs> it's like the reality is some kind of you know mad sack of kittens um, but that's okay we just it's a it's a talk so we just like pretend it's fine you know what's inside your app box and probably already thinking about how you would monitor that in this setup one thing that I think is um, a fun thing to do is also to set up to try the, all these pieces is to just set up like a mini uh, monitoring project so I usually spin up some sort of one Ivan service to pretend to be the app um, it's recently been my weather database because that's what I've been playing with and then an M3 and then a Grafana um, all together so that's quite fun okay so talking to M3 from PHP you use the influx libraries of course you do <laughs> so m3db was introduced a lot of companies have moved from influx to m3db Ivan included and uh, the influx db wire protocol is pretty decent um, it's well designed for this sort of data and so m3 you know it's going to drop into an existing system we're not going to rebuild everything for it and so it support one of the modes it supports in addition to the Prometheus interfaces is the influx DB interfaces so top tip for PHP developers you need the PHP library that supports influx version 1 there is influx version 2 it uses a different PHP library you need this PHP library which is why the composer require line is here in the slides and I'll try and get this into our documentation or blog post or somewhere if you need it for reference because um, yes it's just it's just one of those little tricks that you should know you need the v1 library remember that uh, the connection is what you'd expect you're going to pass the all the information about where your database is any creds if you're not running it locally 
Um, but yeah, it looks like an influx connection. It's actually M3 on the other end. Uh, we're all one big, happy, open source family. So you can connect like this and then to pass data, uh, InfluxDB has this concept of points. So you create points um, and you can also, it's got functionality to pass an array of points, but you can instruct this point and you can kind of see it's got a name, it's got a value. Um, it, it By default, it'll timestamp for now, but you can set that and then you can set some extra tags and anything else that you need to set with it. Um, and you just write it to the database. So in terms of fitting this into our own applications, um, the support is there, even though M3 is pretty new, that I feel like this is working for me, the support is there. Another good way to try this out, if you don't want to write sample PHP scripts, is, like I say, to monitor an existing setup. So for this, I've got my Postgres demo. That's the Manchester rain, I mean weather. It does have other weather sometimes. Um, the Manchester weather data is um, in the Postgres demo. You can see I've just got a couple of nodes there. Uh, then I've got M3, which is set up with that standard three node cluster that you've seen before. And I've got Grafana running as well, um, also on the Ivan platform. So what I like about having all this in one place is first of all, it's like three clicks to spin up each one. And then, and it's, so talk about the Ivan billing. Let's talk about the Ivan billing. It's fixed cost, so you don't get surprises for data transfer or whatever. You get the quote is for an average month's worth of charge, but you just start it up and shut it down. And if it's not on, it's not costing you. Um, which is, <laughs> I hope. Which so then I'm encouraged to shut it down when I finish with it at night. There's like a Slack bot that sends us little reminders, like, okay, you're just burning money on the company account. Oh yeah. Um, so that's like one fun thing to mention because I think the cloud can be quite a scary place to experiment sometimes um, and we don't have that. That was a huge tangent. <laughs> okay, so Postgres, M3, Grafana, uh, the elephant, the owl and the giraffe because that's what happens when you let technical people pick mascots apparently. Um, yeah, so having, if you think of the Postgres as being like, this is my running application, I can set up M3 to collect metrics from any running service or multiple running services. So I just say to M3, yeah, you should start monitoring that Postgres and uh, then please stick stuff on Grafana. So wherever, from either side of those uh, integrations, you just manage the integration in the Ivan web console or script it. Um, if you're using the CLI or the Terraform provider, whatever. Um, and this is a really fun way to immediately see, collect some metrics, talk to M3, just give it a try. This is my favorite kicking the tires kind of approach. This is where I start. And especially because M3 often is used in that sort of monitoring type setup. Um, and when you glue those two, th three things together, you get this, ta-da, um, just a, a little graph of the CPU usage. Um, it's quite neat because the data source is automatically added to Grafana and it knows how, to, how the security creds work. So you can just immediately start picking your data sources and graphing them. It's very nice. When I talked about time series data at the beginning, I mentioned that um, we have the timestamp, the value, and then some other data. And if this is quite a nice example of some other data that we've got the three lines on the graph and the key at the bottom. So you can see there the green line and I've got tags for the cloud, the CPU, uh, the host, <clears throat> which project it is and the various other things that are different about it. It's actually one for each cluster. Um, so that's pretty nice. I quite like that um, for just a very quick on-ramp to see it. Namespaces are the down sampling feature of M3DB and they're completely optional. So if you don't need this, no worries. You don't need to 
like it's not there by default, you just turn it on or not. Every M3 database has to have exactly one, not at least one, not more than one, not less than one, just one unaggregated namespace. So we'll always have that. The incoming data is written to this unaggregated namespace. That's what we do. Optionally, you can add aggregated namespaces. You can have as many as you want. Each one, I feel, comes with some cost because we have to do the processing for the data. And then it also costs in terms of storage. Um, but the way those work are that you can set um, which aggregation you want to use, um, the resolution, so whether we should average over five minutes, four hours, one day, you know, what works, tell us. And then also 30 days. So again, all configurable through the web interface when you're using the Ivan platform. Ivan's own setup, so we're using this in our metrics setup, the way we've got it configured, just to give you an example, is we have unaggregated data that we retain for 48 hours. And I think that's like every 30 seconds or something. And then we also aggregate over 10 minute intervals and we keep that for 30 days. And what's nice about that is the 10 minute intervals is normally fine. It, I mean, if it's happening now, obviously we need more than that. <laughs> if it happened yesterday, we still want to be able to look at it. Look at it. It could be a, still an ongoing incident. But to every 10 minutes for 30 days has been a really nice balance for us. Uh, and the benefits are huge because the amount of data you need, the storage space for um, the every 10 minutes is actually not huge, but the resolution is decent. We've already talked about the lossy nature of downsampling. So, you know, we have to understand that. But this setup means we use a lot less storage than if we kept all of those data points for a month. And also, we probably want to look at it every 10 minutes. So it really improves our query performance when we are either in Grafana or running other queries against it. So the namespaces, you can have as many of these as you want. So if you want to keep everything for 48 hours, uh, once a minute for a week and once a day for 90 days, that's totally configurable. You can do that. And it's the aggregator node, the aggregator component that does this work. So it's got some CPU implications and it does output storage, like it writes back to M3DB, but then you can reduce the retention on that original unaggregated namespace. And I tend to think that the trade-off works. Well, it works out. Yeah, I think, it, I think it works out pretty well. So the aggregator, it does the magic. It does the sampling. It does the storage. It's a separate component on the Ivan platform because if you are not using it, then why would you want to pay us for that? Yeah, we, did, <laughs> we, we didn't think so either. So it's a separate thing. Just spin it up if you're using it. If you're just kicking the tires, you might not need to. So um, yeah, have at it, see what you think. Okay, so time series databases. I've talked about some specialist tools, but also some, some of the things you already know. And I think there's a huge value in the things that we already know, not just that we already know how to use from an application or a developer point of view, but also the things that we already know how to operate. Um, like I say, the majority of what I've seen would have been fine in Postgres. Um, Timescale DB will give you a little bit of extra mileage. Um, every platform's different, and the the data requirements of the applications we build today are only increasing. Like if you're not tackling this problem yet, it's coming. <laughs> I'm super happy that you saw this talk <laughs> um, because I think this is ahead for all of us. And the, the, you know, we, we log so much more data and that's coming to all of our applications. We've got to be able to handle it. We've got to be able to make sense of it. So the specialist tools are out there. I've tried to give you a quick tour and some sense of how to get started with those, how they could fit into what we already know, but also some sense of when 
you need those tools. I think um, we all enjoy the new technology, but sometimes things come out of those very big technical um, technical companies. And in this case, it was Uber. You know, I, I deal a lot with Kafka, which came out of LinkedIn. And not all of us are, are quite dealing with that scale of problem yet. Um, so being understanding the technology and also knowing what your options are and when you can evaluate them or when it would make sense, I think is as, as important as knowing the names of technologies or seeing the code examples and, and, and those kinds of things. I think it's all part of the same thing, being able to design our systems without over-engineering them, being aware of the ecosystem without having to keep up spending hours practicing with every single new innovation. Um, all of this space is pretty approachable. I'm really enjoying it. The graphs are great as well. Um, so I think there's a bunch of things here and I hope that you found it helpful. I am so interested to hear um, which time series problems you're already solving, which ones you expect to be solving pretty soon. Um, so yeah, we do have some time for questions. Um, you can start typing questions. I will, uh, if you're watching live, I don't know if I'm going to exist forever alongside this, this recording, um, but I'm going to leave you with a list of links of things I think you need to know. Um, first up, obviously, Ivan.io. It's got a free trial. We don't even need your card. Just kick the tires. I'm reasonably new in my role at Ivan. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm paid to take your complaints. I would love to hear what you think. Um, I have a huge list of things I want to change. So um, let me know if I'm on the right lines with those. <laughs> uh, Postgres, obviously, let us not overlook um, the, the, the faithful database technologies and Timescale, which is a plugin. Both Postgres and the Timescale extension are available on the Ivan platform. Um, in fact, so is Influx. There's a link to InfluxDB and also M3DB. So I think I'm contractually required to say all of those are available on the Ivan platform. There is a free trial. So if you saw anything you liked, you can go and have a play. Um, that's my website, LornaJane.net. I write about less PHP these days, but still sometimes about technology. Um, and I, it's a good place to keep up with the talks that I'm doing as well as the blog content. I know it's old fashioned to keep a blog. Um, I still find it useful. I'm still referring to it even if no one else is. <laughs> I thoroughly recommend it as well. It's a great way to kind of store your thoughts for later reference. Um, so with that, I'll just say thank you so much for your attention. It's been, I, I mean, I wish I was in Verona um, but it's been a pleasure to be here anyway with you um, and, we, and we can look forward to doing that again sometime in the future. Uh, let me know what you are building and stay in touch. So, okay, great talk Lorna. Now we have some time for questions, but in the meantime, I would like to start with a question of my own. I wanted to know how you got into uh, databases and time series. I think it's a deviation from, you know, uh, simple coding as you started like us. Yeah, well, simple coding is definitely my background, uh, to be honest. Um, I, I've been a PHP developer for many years and I really enjoyed working on some of the bigger projects with some of the bigger database stuff back in the day. I think some of you will also have heard me speak about APIs and that kind of thing. So you have to get into data and that kind of data communication design. Um, I worked on a particular project that I remember, which was like an early IoT smart home type project, and it introduced me to <clears throat> really distributed systems for the first time, but it also, because we had so much data, and I think a lot of people are in this situation now where everything we do, we want to track more data, whether it's clicks or measurements or server metrics. Um, and we, um, yeah, it was just a big challenge. I learned a lot about database indexes in that project because we were just you know, trying to run reports on newest data and all that kind of thing. 
Um, and then I had the opportunity to go and work for a company that had been bought by IBM um, and on their cloud platform. And they had all different open source databases. And I really got to know the different specialist databases, so document databases, time series databases, um, as well as the more traditional uh, relational databases and like Redis that you already know, uh, etcd, that kind of thing. I just got really into it. Like that's really my kind of thing. Done a bunch of other things, but uh, at the beginning of the year, I accepted a role with Ivan, who didn't have developer relations before now. Um, they've been quite a uh, like developer centric. If you know what you need, you just go and integrate it there. They weren't really big into the marketing side. Um, so we've started developer relations there. But again, I have that selection of databases to play with. And because on the Ivan platform, we have Timescale and Influx and M3DB, it's like, oh, look, I think I'll play with some time series data. Okay, great. And while the, the talks was rolling, I've seen someone asking, uh, how do you recognize uh, the fact that your data that you are handling is a time series? And in the talk, you talk about how uh, it's normally a, a, a basic data with a timestamp and uh, it's, it's immutable. So that's basically the answer, but that's the, the low level definition. What I want to know is, do you think there are uh, some common uh, business cases where this could be leveraged? Because I don't think that many of us have to handle temperatures uh, as in your examples, but probably there are cases that can uh, make a way to sell these technologies to the business, let's say. And there are lots and lots of different applications. I mean, common to us all is that you will normally find something like this um some sort of time series data specialist data platform somewhere in your observability setup so that's um for all of us running systems of any sort of scale um you will find that and one of the reasons you know m3db i think probably pre-recorded lorna just said this as well um in m3db has um you know it's not available from many places it's Uber have open sourced it because they outgrew what they were using. Um, it's available on the iPhone platform, not necessarily because we think it's a great business move, but because we needed M3, we outgrew our single core influx. And so <laughs> we, and we really liked it. <laughs> and um, a lot of our bigger customers are more like partners. So we were like, okay, well, then we should offer it as a service. So I think that's the, the the observability piece, you know, being part of your monitoring setup is, that's the place where we see those dashboards of all the different readings following through. And that, so that's something that's common to us all. And I know that this audience is pretty technical, probably does some DevOps stuff as well. I think in terms of pure business requirements, it is, the clue is that you have very simple um, like a primitive data type and a timestamp, and it doesn't change, and you probably need to re produce dashboards or reports or, um, yeah, if you see that pattern where it comes in every minute but you actually need the hourly average, um, then those for me are the tells. And I try to open really strongly at the beginning by saying, you know, if it's not big data, you go a long way with Postgres. So don't feel that you need to get into complicated hosting um, some of these things are not that easy to operate, which is another reason why I love working for databases as a service company. It's got a free trial, kick the tires. If you like it, it's pay as you go. Like, uh, go, go for it. And it's all inclusive pricing, so you don't have that bill shock going on. Um, but I think there's a bunch of things there. But when you've outgrown it and it's a struggle, knowing about the specialist databases and kind of what they are and how to choose, I hope will really help people who need to make that next step now. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, in fact, at my daily job, uh, some time ago, we tried uh, something with the influx uh, for, for the business case. We tried to measure basically uh, some crucial points in the, in the commercial funnel. And we tried to give them, well, to give Grafana to, to the business people so they can observe the, the trending of what we were doing. And we didn't push that so much because, um, but well, basically we already had a lot of 
other stuff like reports and so on. So it's it's hard to sell this kind of technical tools to business people, but still maybe if you have uh, a business that has many, many, many customers that are coming along and buying many small products, for example, that could be useful. Okay, we also had another question from Marco that was asking about if you can use this kind of databases for event sourcing. I think it's a tricky topic. I don't know if you have an answer for that. It's a really good question. And, you know, at the risk of giving another whole talk, I'm going to say, no, events are something else. And the reason is we normally include a bunch of information in our events that might refer to like which thing this relates to, what the event actually was and so on. So some of, sometimes you have event driven applications and they are, they look a lot like metrics and you can use the database, um, the time series databases. But for events, I would typically, especially if it's like really flowing quickly, um, and for data streaming, I would use Apache Kafka. I think I'm contractually obliged to mention that is also available on the Ivan platform. Kafka actually is a bit of a pain to operate. So come and play with the free trial. Don't struggle giving yourself something to play with on that one. But yeah, and that's designed for event for event streaming. So there, there is definitely, there are some use cases that are an overlap. But if you think it's very event-ish, uh, I would send you over to Apache Kafka in the first instance. Yeah, I was expecting that. I, I did a talk in the past about event sourcing and I was talking basically uh, uh, about a thing about reporting that is near to the, the example that I did on the previous question. And we had events with 20 to 50 fields. So yeah, I think that's pretty far from what you have explained to us today. Okay, I don't know if there are... I have, oh, there's a new question from the chat. Let's see. How does self-hosted Grafana work technically? Maybe you could give a rough outline for someone who might want to create a first graph on a dashboard. So yeah, you can self-host Grafana um, in the screenshot that you've seen. So I might not be able to answer the question because it's host. we have it hosted on Ivan. And you click the button saying, I would like Grafana with that. And then you get a Grafana with a login, <laughs> with a URL, with a login, and you configure the data sources. Self-hosted Grafana works pretty similarly. I just haven't done it recently. So you spin up a Grafana. Uh, it's like a web interface. And then you explain to it what your data sources are. So you'll be giving it your whatever databases you're using, also your time series databases, you can have multiple ones. And then you start to build up those dashboards with panels and saying, OK, in this Postgres table, I want this value over time and that value over time um, and you put them on the chart together so you can you can play with grafana it's quite approachable and a, a, it's quite a gooey tool as well um, and there are some good video tutorials out if you check youtube yeah i've, I've played a bit uh i have a couple of grafana deployed but just for the hop stuff so basically the pops out my job give to me to see what's going on in the front structure but yeah you can still play and draw dashboards and small widgets and so on i think they use a, a some kind of query language i don't remember but i don't i don't know if it's specific to the database or, spe or specific to grafana um so often you can use grafana with like promql and that's a really good way of accessing it and i mostly use it against the time series databases because if it's postgres i would just probably talk SQL to the prompt because I'm old fashioned. Um, <laughs> and I don't know, like my SQL muscle memory is pretty strong. Um, I tend just to be poking at it. Um, and like I work in developer relations now, so it's only ever, you know, half a million rows of Manchester data, weather data. It's never really like complicated. Um, and then we can, yeah. So then for the time series data, which is horrible in table form, right? Because it's just a, a mad jumble of numbers. Then, then the visualization is lovely, and the PromQL for the time series backend is a really good choice. Oh, two other questions popped up. Okay, uh, one is from Eugene, and is what kind of metrics does Uber collect with M3DB? If you can tell us that. I can tell what they tell publicly, um, and you'll find it also on the M3DB website. It's quite a good case study. They've got their architecture diagram there, but it's yeah, it's part of their observability setup. So they kind of outgrew what they had. M3DB, so if you're in the ops space, um, the way that I would explain M3DB to you 
in contrast to this talk, which is a bit more application oriented, it's a storage backend for Prometheus. So your Prometheus drags in all of your metrics and then M3DB is the storage for that. And then it's got some components to optimize both the downsampling process and also the query process. Uh, we kind of bundle those in a sensible way as a service for Ivan. Okay, and the other question from Nicola is, uh, uh, as an example, I need to track sent a notification to user. We talk about 3000 entries each per hour. Is this a Temptiris database a good choice for this kind of sites, let's say? I would say this one's a little bit more event-ish. You know, it's like a receipt of something having been sent. So for that, I probably would still look to the data streaming platforms. Okay, okay. Great. Uh, let me see. Well, I think that we are done for now. Thank you, Lorna, again. We're a bit ahead of time, so we'll have um, roughly five minutes to stretch our legs and uh, go around and rate, rate, please rate the talks on joined in. I hope that we'll have uh, every speaker to link their slides there too, so you will have a one place to reach them all. So mine are thank you, there Laura. already, so you can go and collect the slides and maybe just let me know what you liked. Uh, while you were there. And I'm around in the chat. Thanks for having me. Thank you.